Good morning. Today I have with me Phil Johnson. Phil is a coach and he's an expert in leadership and emotional intelligence. Welcome to Managers Club, Phil. Uh, thanks, Fidel. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, Phil, let's jump right in. So for people who don't know, what is emotional intelligence? Great question. Thanks for asking it. A very simple explanation for emotional intelligence is the ability to feel the fear and anxiety that change and innovation triggers in us when we leave our comfort zone. And it's the ability to move through that fear towards our desired result. Oftentimes, we allow our fear to keep us trapped in our comfort zones. And although we may want better results, um, we're actually unwilling to do what I call the emotional labor of moving through that fear and anxiety that change always triggers in us. Could you give an example of what you mean by that? Yeah. Whenever we, there's a part of our old lizard brain that whenever we um, take an action that moves us outside of our comfort zone, it's been trying to keep us safe for the last 500 million years by making sure we never leave the security yes. of our cave. If we do, it automatically triggers the release of a hormone called cortisol into our bloodstream. And that causes the executive center of our brain, our prefrontal cortex to shut off. And we go into what psychologists refer to as, a, as an amygdala hijack, which causes us to often say and do things we later regret. Some people lash out, some people run away, some people freeze like a deer in a headlights. And when that happens in conflict situations, it, often people die. And when it happens in business or personal situations, relationships die, we burn trust. I see. So the way you're defining it, it sounds almost like being able to remain calm and cool under fire, to be able to think and react in an intelligent way. Yeah, it's, it's the ability to stay in the present moment. And when we aren't in the present moment, that triggers our walls to go up. And we often become resistive, judgmental, and attached to outcome, which leads to the chaos, distrust, and toxicity we see in most organizations. I see. Okay. Could you say a little bit of the difference between emotional intelligence and like intellectual intelligence or IQ? Sure. Another great question. Developing emotional intelligence is far greater than intellectual intelligence. As a matter of fact, um, UC Berkeley in California completed a 40-year study comparing IQ with EQ, and they concluded that emotional intelligence was 400% more valuable in determining career, personal, and corporate success than intellectual intelligence. As a matter of fact, I can, give you an ex I can give you an example of a, a company that's currently worth about $3 trillion, and they're doing about $600 billion a year in revenue, and their primary hiring focus is on emotional intelligence. That company is Apple. That's why when you walk into an Apple store, that energy you feel is an example of, of a more emotionally intelligent environment. They're not trying to sell you anything. They're trying to understand your pain and, if possible, offer a solution to your pain. Whether you buy anything or not is secondary. They want you to have a great experience, and maybe you'll tell your friends. Maybe they'll tell their friends. And if you think about it, the energy in that environment is a very different energy than the energy in the store surrounding that, the Apple store. Totally. It's a great experience. So I actually have two questions then. One is, so emotional intelligence, it's not just keeping yourself calm under fire? Like how much of it is that and how much of it is like understanding other people's emotions or in the case of the Apple store, evoking a certain emotion in your customers? Yeah. Like how much is are those two parts? And secondly, we, you talked about hiring for emotional intelligence. I do want to get to that, but we can talk about this first part first. Okay, how you behave, um, your level of emotional intelligence will influence the level of trust engagement of the people around you. And let me explain mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Because we've evolved over hundreds of millions of years from in tribes and herds, we've had to develop the ability to sense whether somebody's trying to help us or eat us. So we have these specialized brain cells 
in our prefrontal cortex that brain scientists call mirror neurons. That's why you can, when you walk into a room, you can sense the energy in the room. Or when you're having a conversation with somebody, you can sense whether they're trying to help you or take advantage of you. So that as you develop your emotional intelligence, as you learn to become less resistive, judgmental, and attached to outcome, the people around you will pick up on that and they'll get a sense that they can be more of who they true who they are around you than they can be around their victim buddies. See, victims travel in packs. Victims travel in packs. They have a codependent relationship, but they don't like each other, they don't trust each other, and they can never lower their walls around each other, but they need each other. So when as you develop your emotional intelligence, you automatically become more of an inspirational leader that people are inspired to want to follow. I see. So if I get what you're saying, then if you give off this vibe, if you, that you're helpful, okay, that you're there to help and you're not a threat, right? Then people will pick up on that. So perhaps that's the feeling you get at the Apple store, that they're mm -hmm. trying to help you rather than prey on you. And so, so that's the system. You mentioned as well, like hiring for emotional intelligence. How do you hire for that? Are you look for certain things or is it just something, okay, you just hire someone and then you just develop and train them in it? Another great question. The short answer is the more emotionally intelligent you are, the easier it is to spot emotional intelligence or the lack of emotional intelligence in other people. I often help hiring executives and HR folks through this process along with developing their emotional intelligence, here are some kind of sample questions that can give you some insights into a person's level of emotional intelligence. Just let me rattle off a few for you. Okay. Why is this role of interest to you? How will this role help you achieve what you want? What do you consider a few of your strengths? What can you teach us? Who's responsible for your results? When was the last These time? Are... When was the last time you were embarrassed? How did this happen? What did you do? As example. So I see. So these are questions you would ask to, and then based on the answer, to judge a candidate's emotional intelligence. Right. right? To enter a higher state of emotional intelligence. Like, what are some things you can do? A very simple thing you can do is focus on your breathing. Because if you just, for instance, if you were to just close your eyes and take three or four deep breaths where you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth and you focus on that, that shuts off your thinking. That brings you more into the present moment. You can't be thinking and focusing on your breath at the same time. Another way is laughter. Um, okay. Laughter brings you out of your, the left side of your brain and moves you into the right side of your brain. And it actually sends a signal to others that you're trustworthy. It actually creates what's called a limbic system lock. So when people are getting along, when they're having fun, they're actually building trust. So some of what you're describing sounds to me somewhat related to, for example, meditation, like people yeah. do like breathing exercises and things yeah. like that. Meditation is another way of slowing your brain down and becoming more present. A lot of listeners to Managers Club are, you know, they're, they're managers, executives, tech leads. So could you give an example of how someone um, a leader you've worked with used emotional intelligence in the workplace to re achieve a remarkable result that they might not otherwise. As you develop your emotional intelligence, you there are several things that occur at the same time. It's not just not a serial process; it's a parallel process. As you learn to stop giving away your energy, you're actually developing your emotional intelligence. You're becoming a more inspirational leader. You're becoming more conscious of what's going on in you and around you, that which creates a freedom from ego-based fear, which leads to higher levels of trust and engagement, resulting in career, personal, and corporate success. See, the current level of employee engagement worldwide 
according to Gallup, is around 13%. Low levels of employee engagement are costing the U.S. economy over a trillion dollars a year, and there's almost a one-to-one correlation between the level of employee engagement and the level of customer engagement, so that if you need a title to get people to follow you, you're not a leader. If your actions don't inspire followers, you're not a leader. And quite frankly, <clears throat> leadership's not a, it's not a position, it's not a title, it's a choice. So that as you learn, as you develop your emotional intelligence, you automatically become a more inspirational leader. That's just one of the outcomes. Okay, let me challenge you a little bit on this because in, my, in the tech industry, we talk about a lot of entrepreneurs, right? And many of them are very inspiring. And you mentioned Apple, right? Like Steve Jobs, I'm going to say he was a very inspiring leader, but he wasn't very nice. He was judgmental and he had criticized people, apparently, from what I've read. And how do you reconcile these inspirational leaders who are actually very aggressive? Yeah. They're not leaders. They're not leaders. So you don't think like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, people there's, like that are leaders? Different. No. If your actions don't create higher levels of engagement, if they don't create followers b- based on your behavior and the results, you're simply using position-based power to control and manipulate. There's a difference between being a driven entrepreneur, a brilliant driven entrepreneur and being a leader, all you have to do, over 80% of all M&A ventures fail, over 80% of all employee organizational change initiatives fail, current level of employee engagement is 13%. Whatever we've been doing isn't working. Well, no, I can't argue with that. Certainly, I agree that overall these numbers are very low. But I guess what I'm trying to reconcile is there's some people, and as you become, as you move up the corporate ladder, one thing that seems to be valid, at least in certain organizations or definitely for entrepreneurs, right? These is this, yeah, this kind of, how do I say, um, assertive, assertiveness, which seems a little bit different than what you're describing. You're describing someone who seems a little bit more calm and not reactive. Yeah, exactly. Say whatever results you get based on trying to control and manipulate others using position-based power are a fraction of the results you could be getting. So I don't deny that using position-based power can control them to get better results, can create a result, but at what cost? And over and above the cost, the very hidden cost often really pales in comparison to the results you could be getting by becoming a more inspirational leader. Can you be a hard-driving executive that really focuses entirely on results at all costs? That'll work for a while. That, quite frankly, that's what we've been doing for a very long time. But I would suggest that the results are a fraction of what they could be at a much lower cost by developing your emotional intelligence. So if that's true, why don't more people understand that? Why is this not more widespread Excellent question, uh, question. Because the development of emotional intelligence is an experiential process. It's not an intellectual process. And what I mean by that is that you cannot develop your emotional intelligence by having a conversation or reading a book or watching a podcast or watching a video. Those are intellectual processes and will do nothing to develop your emotional intelligence. The development of emotional intelligence is an experiential process focused on what you do, not what you think. And I can tell you from experience, it's harder than hell to develop, but the ROI is incredible. And the ROI keeps getting greater as you practice these abilities. So are you saying then the reason we don't see this more often 
It's just because it's hard. You have, like, it's just so hard to develop this skill. That's why we don't see it. Couple reasons. A, first of all, we're only conscious about three to 5% of the time. The rest of the time, we're relying on our unconscious habits to drive our behavior and our results. And that's fine. But quite frankly, we don't know what we don't know. Our educational system has failed us and our employment system has failed us because it's focused primarily on our ability to do intellectual labor and it's done nothing to develop our emotional intelligence. So I, quite frankly, people think they know much more than they do because they've read a book or had a conversation or watched a video. But if what you think you know isn't reflected on what you do, you don't really know it. You just think you do. So you're saying like the educational system has failed. So basically people don't know. What I'm hearing is that people just don't know about emotional intelligence. So this is why we don't see it. Let me ask a different question. Now, let's say someone becomes aware, okay, uh, I should increase my emotional intelligence. Uh, what are some of the challenges that people encounter? Maybe what are some of the main challenges people encounter in developing their emotional intelligence that holds them back? Sure. There are three major challenges. <clears throat> Two are biological, one sociological. <clears throat> the first biological one I mentioned earlier with our amygdala. <clears throat> the second biological source of resistance is our current habits. See, once we develop a habit, it's a neural network pathway in our brain, and we can develop new habits at any age it's called brain plasticity or neurogenesis. And even though those new habits can work better than our old habits, they're always going to be weaker than our old habits. So there's going to be an ongoing battle internally within us between our old habits and our new habits for dominance. The third source of resistance is uh, sociological, meaning that people around us don't want us to change. Because if we change and start to get better results, that scares the hell out of them. And the best way to ensure they don't have to change is to make sure we fail. So they can say, look, I told you, now shut up and get your head down and come back into the herd with the rest of us. So even though the development of emotional intelligence works like hell, it'll work for anybody at any age, doing anything, anywhere. People don't know what they don't know, and it's harder than hell to do. Like going to the dentist. Nobody would ever go to the dentist unless they're either in pain or trying to avoid pain. So unless you have an urgent desire for better results, unless you have an emotional connection to a desired result that's larger than the fear mm -hmm. that's going to get triggered in you, not going to be willing to do the emotional labor that better results requires. And quite frankly, uh, most people aren't. Would you like an example? Do you have an example in the workplace? would be great. I do. Sure. Perfect, Ben. Um, this is called authentic listening. The key to authentic listening is not to take anything personally. How somebody feels about you doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with what's going on inside of them. I was going to give you a different example, but I'll give you a, an example from my corporate life. Um, I spent 20 years as an executive in the semiconductor industry. And one day, one of my sales engineers came to me and said that he had just heard that we were going to be three months delinquent on our prototype shipment of some microcontrollers to one of his clients. And he was quite upset about that. And the client was quite upset about that. So we arranged a meeting the next day to meet with the client. And in the meantime, I found out what happened. Turned out that uh, one of the production managers had a question about the laser marking on the parts and took the parts out of the flow got the question answered, but forgot to put the parts back in. So best case, we were going to be three months late and the customer had already written the code for the parts. So they were stuck. So that's the message I had to go and meet with the client with the next day. So I met with a client and he was actually also the owner and the engineering manager. And he was very upset. Um, uh, and I said, I'm not here to try. I want, I'm here to try and I wanted to tell you what went wrong and uh, what we're trying to do to get you your devices as quickly as possible. But I'd also, if it's okay with you, I would like to meet with your customer and explain to them why you're going to be linked delinquent in your prototype shipments to them. And so when I did that, his tension level went completely away. See, he was afraid that he was going to have to face his customer alone 
and that it might jeopardize the follow-on production business. So I met with this customer the next day and explained the situation to him. And he said, not the best news in the world, but we can move some things around. We'll be fine. Thanks for coming in. See, if I had lowered my walls, if I hadn't been more present, I wouldn't have the I wouldn't have been able to try and understand my client and his client and try to get to the root cause of the fear and propose a solution to that fear. So that's an example of how being more present, lowering our walls, can enable us to be more creative and look at the challenges we face as opportunities for better results. See, the only time people really need us is when they're in pain. And if we allow their pain to become our pain, we're not really helping them at all. We need to have the emotional intelligence to recognize where somebody is and try to help them through their pain. And that's exactly what happens in the Apple store. When people come in, when customers come into the Apple store, they're in, they're in pain. They want, they're there to look for a solution to something that's bothering them. And if we allow their anxiety to become our anxiety, we lose our effectiveness. And that okay. all has think, to do with emotional intelligence. Bill, you've been really generous with your time. Thank you so much for coming on the Managers Club. Where can people reach out to you if they wanted to learn more about emotional intelligence or just connect with you? Thanks. It's, here, I'll just put a, a link in the chat box. And if people want to meet with me, they can meet with me via Skype. That's my calendar link, along with some, some videos from execs that have gone through the program. Uh, I'd be happy to to meet with Wei, everybody, anybody who wants to continue the conversation, and that would be great. All right. Awesome. I'll put a link to that in the notes. Thanks again. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been great being on your show. Thank you.